Today I have a guest whose story will help show you how to bring light into the dark areas of your past and inspire you to hope for a bright future. Watch this and we'll be back to talk with Ann Byler, founder of Auntie Ann's Pretzels. Have you ever experienced the pain of betrayal or lived in the shadows of guilt and shame? Has death ever ripped a loved one from your grasp, leaving you with nothing to hold but the darkness of depression? Unfortunately, Ann and Jonas Byler can say yes to all of these questions. There's no doubt that the early story of their lives holds many dark pages. Growing up in my home and in the Amish community today, it's family, it's community, and it's church. And the other part of that is work. Um, I was in the house because I had allergies as a kid, so I, was, I learned how to bake and to cook and be in the house a lot with my mom. So I remember making dinners, and there was eight of us, so there's 10 of us around the table, and just sitting around the table with my family was the fondest memories of my growing up years. And we didn't have any music, we didn't have television or radio, or uh, so there's nothing that would ever distract us from family. We were just together. I grew up in a old older Amish home I was there till I was 16. When my dad wanted to buy me my first horse and buggy, I told him I would rather have a car because I wanted horsepower, not horses. <laughs> At that time, I had an older brother. Sonny and I would do a lot of things together. We were, we were soul buddies. Life was never the same without him. Sonny was coming to my youth group. He was such a character, and I, I just turned 16. and. In that culture, you, you can't go anywhere without your mom and dad until you're 16. And then you're allowed to go, what they call, run around, or, or in Dutch they call it, you can, rumspringa, they call that in Dutch. And so it was during that time that I met his brother, Sonny. He and I got to talking and we just had a lot of fun together. He said, you need to meet my brother, Jonas. Uh, I think you'd like him. He kept telling me, you need to meet this Anne. You need to meet this lady. I think you would like her. <laughs> and so he was Sonny telling was her the same thing. <laughs> Sonny was our connector, I guess. And yeah. so we had a party for Sonny and I, I went to the party and it was there that I met Jonas. We played the game called Walk a Mile. The night of the party, I was anxious all evening because I wasn't sure when I was going to ask her out, and I wanted to do it in the worst way, but I just couldn't work up the nerve. And I was just uh, very uh, nervous and giddy almost inside, thinking, is he ever going to ask me out? I'm sure my heart skipped a beat before I got a chance <laughs> to ask you, but I finally did it. You finally did it at the end of the evening. We did a lot of dating with my brother and his girlfriend and had a lot of fun together. And one weekend we went on a vacation to a lumberjack meeting in the mountains and they left early that weekend and the next day there was a knock on the door and we got word that he was killed in a motorcycle accident. After Sonny's death, uh, Jonas was a different person. A part of him left uh, with his brother and I really wondered, is this the man for me or, or not? And uh, as time went on, I realized that there, there's still in in the midst of all of that, there was a quiet and inner strength. There was, there was a, a real man inside of this quiet man. And over time, I knew that, that he was the man for me, and I knew that God put us together. I was probably one of the happiest brides ever. I thought I was the luckiest girl alive. But during that time, uh, we had really gotten into, um, we called them prayer and praise meetings in the homes. Uh, there was seven of us, my sisters, boyfriend and husband and my one brother. And we prayed and asked God to give us land so that we could build a church on. Because we, we didn't want to go to our Mennonite church anymore and we didn't want to go to the Amish. And so we, the church was started. We eventually, my dad actually gave us some land for, for the church and we became youth pastors. It was, I, I think about that, I, I just, um, we had revivals 13 weeks and every single night we went to church. Every single night people accepted Christ. It was a very exciting time. So life was for us was like more than we ever oh my, dreamed. Yeah. We had our oldest daughter, then we had a second daughter and I was never disappointed, never second guessed the fact that we were married. It was just... Storybook marriage at that time. At that time. <laughs> and then... In the summer of uh, 1975, um, I'd had a few dreams uh, they were dreams about something happening to my family and that somebody was dying. Phi at the time was uh, still living at home with my parents and so we were close as siblings. Phi and I spent a lot of time together and, and because we live right next to my parents, 
her and Angie, our second daughter, uh, were very close. And that particular morning that Angie went up to my, my mom's house, uh, Fi knew that Angie was going to make her little trek up there. She did it every morning. That morning, um, I went out, and it was right, right around 9 o'clock. And we had already worked for like about an hour, and uh, I needed to, to um, jump on the, on the tractor. And, and I, I was at the phone. I picked up the phone to give her a call to say that Angie's on her way up there because they live right next door to us. And I always turned around and looked because I was always aware that there were kids around. I saw no one, nothing. I heard all of this noise, this screaming, and this, it was like piercing screams. I can't, I can still hear it in my head. And the next thing I saw was out of the corner of my eye, I saw my father just waving his hands, just. Honestly, it was almost like somebody picked her up from the corner of the shed, and right there she was. I saw her body just right there, it was just laying right there. I just, I just lost it, I just lost it, and um... I stopped and I thought, not Angie, because immediately I remembered the, the dreams, and I thought, And I re just remember clearly that I just, um, all I could say was, no, God, not Angie. Not Angie. I, I couldn't believe it. I was just looking around, trying to figure out what, I was, what, am I, what am I supposed to do here? What am I supposed to do? And then I saw my father run back to the house with her. And he was carrying her, just running back toward the house and just telling me that Angie's dead. I remember I saw my father and Anne take off in the car, and I knew where they were going, and I felt alone. I just felt like, oh, what am I supposed to do? When I came to the clinic, just inside the front door, somebody somehow knew who I was and took me to the room where Anne was, and I seen this little girl laying there with a sheet over her, her little hand sticking out from under the sheet and uh, uh, just in disbelief I mean we embraced each other and she said to me isn't there something we can do can we pray that God would bring her back to us and my response to her was if she is where we want to be why would I call her back I think we spent a little time there and gathered our thoughts the best we could and realized that we need to go home. I just cried and I, I said, Jonas and Ann are never going to forgive me. And I was worried about that. Well, I guess Ann asked, where's Phi? And her mom said, Phi believes you won't ever forgive her. And my immediate response was, what she don't know is, I'm not gonna hold this against her. It was an accident. It just didn't even dawn on me that she was in her own little um, place of terrible pain. I remember just walking up to her and, and just tapped her on the shoulder and said, Fi. I said, it's okay, it's okay. It was time for Angie to go. It's time for her to be in heaven today. It's gonna be okay. Little did we know what's ahead. Stay with us, we'll be right back with more of the Byler's amazing story of forgiveness and hope. So see, even the fact that he said that, yeah. was a yeah. setup from God. Yes, exactly. exactly. It was My gosh, I may have a moment right yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. The 
the, the day that Angie was killed was, was um, obviously a day that changed my life forever. I, I, I didn't even understand that, that, that day, that how much life would change for me. And I talked about Angie for a little while, but I would never bring her up, never talk about it unless you ask me. Because I felt like if I talk to you about how I feel or, or just mention her name, I'm longing. I wish people just would say to me that they miss Angie. But nobody said anything. But I think it's because of my kind of statement that I made that I'm just going to get on with life, you know? So I'm not blaming anyone. It's just the way I did it. But I wanted people just to tell me how much they missed her. I think I was very alone. I realized that other people and and our friends and family and church family, you know, life goes on for them. They don't sit at a table where there's an empty spot. Uh, they don't walk down the hallway going to their bedroom where there's an empty crib. Uh, and I think there was a time when I really struggled, you know, to make sense out of that. But I realized that uh, after experiencing my brother's death that, you know, life does go on. You do eventually get back to this new normal without these people. But it was definitely a time where this wall of silence grew between us. And it happened because I thought she was doing okay, and she thought I was doing okay. Rather than risk bringing this subject up and making the other one cry, we just begin to get quiet. I was, I was the social butterfly. I, I was the one that had all the answers. If you had a problem, well, just do this or do that. So all of a sudden, I had nothing to say. And uh, feeling this, this great sadness and guilt for not being more victorious. I mean, there's a Bible verse that says, so and so, this is what I should, this is what I should be doing or feeling, or this is how I should be acting, and I can't, I'm just, I'm just sad. And uh, so the very next week uh, in a service at church, I was at the altar praying, and, and our pastor came down and um, prayed with me and wondered if there's anything he could do for me, and I just said, no, I'm just, I'm just sad. And, and before he got up from the prayer, he asked me to come by his office and, and talk to him. Before I left his office that uh, Monday morning, he told me that uh, he knows that I'm in deep grief and that I'm, I'm very sad and that I have many needs, but that he knows that Jonas wouldn't be able to meet those needs. And then he kissed me. I remember thinking, I'll never tell anyone what just happened. I was going to keep this a secret. That was the first mistake. I remember the morning that he asked me to meet him at, at a, another town. And uh, I, what happened then was that he took me to a motel and uh, he raped me. It was such despair and such guilt and such shame that I, I can't describe it because I kept saying if I would not have met him, this would never have happened. Well, because I was feeling that way, um, and there's really no hope, so that's one of the reasons why I stayed in that relationship, because it was more like self-punishment. I felt like I didn't deserve anything good anymore. It was so devastating for me at that time because he actually was able to separate me from my sisters who were very close friends of mine, and we sang together in the church every Sunday. And uh, it, it got to the point where I was completely controlled and manipulated even to the point where I couldn't even talk to my sisters on the phone. When I look back on all of it now, I was really becoming very angry at him because I didn't like uh, being with him. I didn't like uh, what he was doing to me. And I began to complain to him about, I wanted to, to connect with my sisters again. And he would always just tell me that, you know, if I talk to them or if I tell anyone, that everyone would believe his side of the story. They would never believe me. So that was his way of keeping me um, from talking to anyone. Uh, after about four years, I, I found out that he was also uh, with my sisters and also two of my best friends. I'm really getting very angry at him now and beginning to feel 
was just completely stuck, like, how, how can I begin my life now? How can I start over? One night I was asking God for, I just really want to connect with my sisters. I began to be long, I was longing, and my heart hurt. I just, I wanted to, to reconnect with them. And uh, one Sunday morning we went to church, and um, uh, when I got there, there was an empty chair beside my sister, Fi. I decided that I'm gonna go sit beside her. And when I did, um, she reached over and put her arm on my shoulder and gave me just a, a small hug. And I felt like a kid with a new toy. I was like, wow, what is this? What happened? Why would she be nice to me? Or why would she even acknowledge or, or give me a hug? And so after the service, um, she actually invited me to her house for coffee. Uh, I said, aren't you seeing the pastor anymore? And she said, no, I'm not. I was like, wow. And I was like, well, how did you get away from me? <laughs> so we had this for the first time in four or five years. Uh, we actually began to talk about what was going on in our life. And she became the strength that I needed after probably almost a year later, I was finally able to, uh, to walk away. I was in the dark. And when this came to the surface, when she shared it with me, I was just totally devastated. I would, I would say I was probably close to being very dangerous to myself. But as time went on, I realized that uh, that's not what I want to do, and I want to salvage this if I can. I called a counselor that had spent a weekend at our church about two weeks prior to this and told him what was going on. When I made the call, he challenged me with something that absolutely changed my life. He said, if there's any hope for your marriage, it'll be in this, and that is that you're able to love your wife the way Christ loves you. And I struggled with that for months to try and figure out how it is that Christ loves me. And I just see God working in all of that because it took the spotlight off of her and what she did and how I felt wronged by some of that. And I was busy trying to figure out how am I gonna love her with this unconditional love. All the while, I'm, I'm the recipient of this love. When I had nothing inside of me that was good, He loved me. And that's why I'm here today. I didn't have time to condemn her, judge her, accuse her. I was too busy trying to figure this out. Christ loves us without conditions. He doesn't ask you where you were. He doesn't ask you why. He's just there when you come back. Not once, every time. Anne always gives me uh, way too much credit in that she says, it's because of me and I was Christ to her. That's really not the way I see it because I feel like Christ was doing a work in both of us. It's her response to this that makes it as real or as good as anything. But the real benefits of both of us allowing God to work through us this way is that today, things are good again. The most wonderful gift, the greatest reward, is to be able to be together. And actually, <laughs> <laughs> Watch out. Enjoy. Enjoy. And like yeah. being together. I often tell him there's nobody I'd rather hang out with than him. He, he's, he was Jesus to me when I was broken. I love this man. Well, I'm here with Ann Byler, the founder of Auntie Ann's Pretzels. You heard her powerful story in the first half of the show. And now she's here with us to talk more about how forgiveness led her out of the darkness of her past. Well, Ann, it's good to have you with us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Of course, I got a chance to meet you a couple months ago, and uh, we walked by a Auntie Ann's Pretzel <laughs> company right there in the mall. That's right. And uh, how many stores did you have? What was the most amount of stores that... I, I had the company, I started the company in 1988, and when I sold the company in 05, 
we had about 850 locations. Yeah. 850 locations. Yes. And today yeah. they have about 1,100 locations yeah. and we're in 22 countries. So yeah. maybe some of your viewers will uh, be able to find an Auntie Anne's pretzel store somewhere. Yeah, they, pro they probably will. Yes. And so here you are now. You've gone from that horrible mess. And this is the thing I want our viewers Amazing. to see Amazing. is that you've gone from that horrible, unspeakable, unbelievable mess. Yes. Lost your daughter through a tragic accident. Mm -hmm. shut down, wouldn't have any communication with your husband, your marriage was in trouble, your pastor seduced you, you're in a six-year affair with him, found out he's involved with several women in the congregation, finally told your husband, we're going to hear about that tomorrow. Now, you've started this business, you've ran it, you've sold it, and now you're, you're ministering, telling your story all over the place. It's really pretty unbelievable what God can do in our lives. It, it is it? totally unbelievable how He redeems the very things that hurt us so bad. Yes. And my philosophy at that time was that life is good mm -hmm. and God is harsh. I yeah. came from a very legalistic background. And so when Angie was killed, um, it was hard for me to understand. I was doing everything just right. Yeah, right. You know? <laughs> I was a pretty good girl, you know. We lived, uh, we lived in the church basically, right. and uh, so when that happened, it just uh, it threw me a curb. And I think that I would have probably gotten through that all right, except that after about five months of just despairing and feeling like I have to be victorious, mm -hmm. overcoming, right, <laughs> and I wasn't allowed to be down or look defeated or look because of the circle that you were in, the <laughs> Christian right. circle you That's were right. in. You needed to be victorious yes, all the time. Yes, I needed to. I wasn't allowed to look, yeah, uh, yeah weak. That's bad. So, yeah, and everybody <laughs> would say to me, oh, you're so strong, you know, yeah. and I'd, ah, but inside I was dying. Right, yeah. And uh, so that caused me just such great, I think my philosophy, my theology was wrong. What yeah. I know now, right. six decades later, right. is that life is hard and God is good. That's exactly right. Yes. Yes. And so I was confused about those two. Yeah. And uh, so after five or six months of just silence, my husband and I had been very good friends. We were young uh, when we got married, 19 and 21, and it's what you do in the Amish culture, and uh, we were happy. Mm -hmm. And when Angie killed, all of that changed. We just weren't able to connect anymore, uh, weren't able to talk about our feelings. I think it's interesting that that happens to people. And I mean, I've talked with it's other people. It's like very normal. Common. They just, I mean, many people even end up getting divorces when 90, a child dies. 95%. It's just amazing to me how God took Jonas and I and our family, my siblings, and took all of us and put us in yeah. this company called Auntie Anne's. And, yes. You know, and I've often said, out of our pain, our purpose was born. It's unbelievable. I'm just so amazed at God's grace. Yeah. You know, I always felt like the grace was good enough for yeah. anybody in Africa or somewhere else yeah. <laughs> if they sin or right. the person on the street. But as a believer, because I failed so miserably and I right. sinned so badly, it, the grace wasn't there for me. Yeah. And I've really had to, I mean, I, I just really had to understand or, or God just really showed me one day, the year 2003, which is just seven years ago, I understood for the first time ever really accepting God's grace for all of my sin, my guilt. He paid for all of it. And it probably brought you closer to Unbelievable. God. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you sin and you're, you're guilty, what else can you do except either self-destruct or reach out and accept God's grace for yeah. you. And that's what I did. And I'm thinking about um, when Jesus said to the woman yeah. who was a prostitute, yes. when you're forgiven for much, mm -hmm. then you love, love much. It. And so I just want to make sure that you out there watching us by TV today know that there's no pit so deep that God won't reach down in it and lift you out. He loves you. He loves you unconditionally. Please don't hide from God or stay away from God or ignore God because you've made mistakes in your life. Don't listen to the lie of Satan that God will not have you back, that it's too late for you, that you've made too many mistakes because where sin abounds, grace does much mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. abound. Mm -hmm. Grace is always greater mm -hmm. than sin. And we just want you to understand that you don't have to live your whole life with wounded emotions you don't have to live full of bitterness and resentment because of something that has happened to you.